Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Yahweh's Assembly and Messiah in Rocheport, Missouri. It's good to see all your smiling faces out there. It's a beautiful day outside, and I know you're listening to the cicadas. You're hearing them. You're seeing them. Praise Yahweh. we got to cherish these things while we have it. Every 17 years, is that what it is? Hallelujah. All in Yahweh's timing. All right. If you'll stand with me and... Uh, Humble ourselves and we'll go before Yahweh before we start this service. Father Yahweh, thank you for this uh, the 49th day, the seventh Sabbath. We're counting it right now as we stand here as a witness that you have given us instructions as how to keep your holy days. And Father Yahweh, as we come into your presence for this Sabbath service, we just ask that you uh, watch over everyone that's gathered here and there may be a few stragglers coming in a little late that's okay father yahweh they're doing the best they can and uh, we're glad to have everyone joining with us and father we just uh, we want to turn this service over to you for your direction and for your protection and father bless the speakers that uh, you've called out for this chosen day and uh, father just be with us in this worship service that's all we can ask for in the precious name of our kinsman redeemer, Yahshua Hamashiach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. This is, as I said, day 49 and the counting of the Omer, the 10th day of the third month, or on man's calendar, the Gregorian thing you got up on your refrigerator probably. It'd be May 18th, 2024. They need that out in the world so they can tune in and see what we're doing here. Hallelujah. All right. Our call to worship. It comes to us from Psalms chapter 9. Do better without these reading glasses, I believe. Psalms chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. You can read along with me. I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my heart. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Hallelujah. All right, so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the musicians, and I'll say, just stand if you're able and sing with us. If not, sing with your sit down <laughs> as you're sitting down. It's great. Praise Yahweh with us.
This time, and you know what? This this is a Yahweh thing right here, right now. Because uh, who but Yahweh would have known months ago when we, months or even maybe a year ago, when we began reading Torah from Genesis 1-1, that on this day we would be at Leviticus 23 in our reading one chapter a week to end up at Leviticus 23 the day before the Feast of Weeks. What are the odds? That's a Yahweh thing. I'm going to uh, read through this. I'm not going to expound. I believe we have a sermonette and a main speaker for today. So I'm just going to read through Leviticus 23, and I'm going to read it from this Holy Name Bible. Uh, Elder Trana put this together, and I like it because it's in large print. I found a couple of errors, printing errors, not his fault, but uh, if I miss something or something's missing from the text, please let me know later because I'm keeping track of it. Leviticus 23. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. Six days. Shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Yahweh in all your dwellings. Verse 4. These are the feasts of Yahweh, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourth day of the first month, toward evening, Yahweh's Passover lamb is to be offered. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto Yahweh. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. Verse 7. In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh seven days. 
In the seventh day, it is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Verse 9. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land, which I will give to you, and ye shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the firstfruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it, and ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto Yahweh. And the meal offering thereof shall be two tenths deal of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto Yahweh for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen. Verse 14. And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your Elohim. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbath shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, ye shall number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meal offering unto Yahweh. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deal, and they shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto Yahweh. Verse 18. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto Yahweh, with their meal offering and their drink offerings even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto Yahweh. Verse 19, Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before Yahweh. With the two lambs they shall be holy to Yahweh for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the self same day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Verse 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of the field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am Yahweh your Elohim. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement, and it shall be a holy convocation unto you. And ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. And ye shall do no work in that self same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. Verse 29, For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among the people. And whatsoever, whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Verse 31, Ye shall do no manner of work, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, ye shall celebrate your Sabbath. Verse 33, And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. 
for seven days unto Yahweh. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. On the eighth day there shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. Verse 37. These are the feasts of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh, a burnt offering, and a meal offering, a sacrifice, and a drink offering, everything upon his day. Verse 38, Besides the Sabbaths of Yahweh, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give unto Yahweh, also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto Yahweh seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Verse 40, And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of fruit trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim seven days, and ye shall keep it a feast unto Yahweh seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All the Israelites born, all that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your Elohim. Verse 44 now concluding. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feasts of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Okay, at this time now, I am going to call up Brother Ben Burgett to give us our first message of the day. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, the title of my message is, What If He Returns Tomorrow? Oh, uh, well, let's see. So I was reading online. I came across a debate these people were having. It's a, um, it's kind of just a religious debate. It wasn't anything too specific. But uh, regardless of the outcome of the debate, um, the mess, this message is still applicable. So regardless of kind of how you see it, um, this still applies. So to get started, let's read a story about um, oppression, being small in number, um, but then being used by Yahweh for great things. And this is kind of Israel being persecuted, but delivered by a few. Um, we're going to read a little bit, and then here pretty quick, you're going to hear me all tell what we're talking about. So go to Judges 6, which this is also kind of interesting because I don't remember ever really being in Judges much for one of my messages. A lot of these, you know, those booked through there, like the numbers and Judges and all that area, kind of, I feel like I overlook a lot. So once I started this, I got, you know, a little bit more excited about it because I'm hardly ever really in this area. So Judges 6, and we'll start verses 1 through 6, but we're going to read a lot of this story. And I guess if you don't know, um, this is dealing with Gideon. And this is dealing with the Israelites uh, turning away from Yahweh. They started worshiping false idols. And this is Yahweh using very few men to deliver them and turn them back to him, which is a common theme through Israel. But I really like this. I really like this story. So this is this is Israel really being persecuted by the Midianites for turning away from Yahweh. Uh, let's just start here. Judges 6, 1 through 6. And it says, And the land had rest 40 years. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and Yahweh gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. The hand of Midian prevailed over Israel, 
And because of Midian, the Israelites provided for themselves hiding places in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. For whenever the Israelites put in seed, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp, they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the land as far as the neighborhood of Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they and their livestock would come up and they would even bring their tents as thick as locusts. Neither they nor their camels could be counted. So they wasted the land as they came in. Thus Israel was greatly impoverished because of Midian, and the Israelites cried out to Yahweh for help. <clears throat> so, just consider this for a second. Seven years of hiding in caves. They're hiding in the caves, they're hiding in woods. Um, whenever they went out to plant a crop, the Midianites would come in and destroy their crops. So they can hardly plant. They're starving. They're living out in, you know, very... <laughs> Just, it's, it's not an easy way to live, and this, they, this went on for seven years. Um, so let's think about that. Just keep that in the back of your mind, that the struggle they're having, not really like in their main homes. Uh, so let's keep reading. Let's go down to verse 11, and we'll read 11 through 16. So Judges 6, 11, it says, Now the angel of Yahweh came and, came and sat under the oak at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Bezirite, and his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him and said to him, Yahweh is with you, you mighty warrior. Gideon answered him, But sir, if Yahweh is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us, saying, Did not Yahweh bring us up from Egypt? But now Yahweh has cast us off and given us into the hand of Midian. Then Yahweh turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. I hereby commission you. He responded, But sir, how can I deliver Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Then Yahweh said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike down the Midianites, every one of them. So think about that for a second. They're living out in the caves. They are impoverished. They're starving. Yahweh comes to this one individual and says, I want you to lead a certain amount of people and deliver Israel from these people coming against you. And in his mind, he's saying, I'm the weakest of the family. Like, our clan is small. How, how am I going to get this done? <clears throat> so this part here coming up is what I really want to focus on. And it's that Yahweh knew how to pick the warriors to fight with Gideon. Um, those few who were more worth more than the vast armies of the Midianites and all those that are coming against Israel here. So Yahweh is about to tell them, here's how you pick a true warrior. Here's how Yahweh is selecting who he wants to fight on his behalf. We'll get there in a second. But go to verses 25 through 32. We'll skip on down a little bit. <clears throat> it says, That night Yahweh said to him, Take your father's bull, the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father, and cut down the sacred pole that is beside it. And so I looked up the reference to that, and that pole is the Asherah poles, which you know a lot about that. So Israel is clearly worshiping Baal, and they're not worshiping Yahweh at this point. So he's asking Gideon to take down these poles, to take down these sacred altars to the other deities. It says, And build an altar to Yahweh, your Elohim, on top of the stronghold here, in proper order. Then take the second bowl and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the sacred pole that you shall cut down. So <laughs> Yahweh wants him to cut down their altar to Baal, and use the wood as fire. It says, So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as Yahweh told him, but because he was too afraid of his family and the townspeople to do it by day, he did it by night. So although he knows all the clan, even Israel, is going to come against him for doing this, he did it anyway, but he tried to hide it so that nobody would know that it was him doing it. <clears throat> it 
So it's the deliverance started, Yahweh's deliverance here, started by getting rid of the false worship and then turning to worship Yahweh. So he's getting rid of their idols and he's turning that worship to him. And this is what's putting Yahweh on Gideon's side and Israel's side for this battle to deliver them physically. Go down to verse 33 real quick. It says, Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together. And crossing the Jordan, they encamped in the valley of Jezreel. So right here, Midian and the Amalekites, they are basically setting up camp right beside this area and getting ready to wipe Israel off the earth. They're getting ready to attack them and get Gideon, all their clans, they're, they're prepping, and they're very close. I mean, if we looked at geography today, like that is a very close area that they're at. So Israel's here, you're poor, you're starving, you have this very large army very close to you about to attack you. So that's to set that up in your mind. As we go, we're talking a lot about the physical. Think about the spiritual aspect of this. Think about the spiritual aspect of who Yahweh is going to choose to help Gideon fight. Think about the spiritual aspect of where Israel was at that time. They're very far from Yahweh spiritually because they're worshiping Baal. So they're just now turning back to him. And then Yahweh is going to select who he wants Gideon to pick to fight on his behalf for the physical and also the spiritual. So Judges 7, Judges 7, 1 through 2, It says, Then Gideon and all the troops that were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harad. And the camp of Midian was north of them, below the hill of Morah in the valley. Yahweh said to Gideon, The troops with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Israel would only take the credit away from me, saying, My own hand has delivered me. So it shows that Gideon summoned 32,000 men to fight for him. But Yahweh wanted him to use fewer so so that they knew it was Yahweh who delivered them and not themselves. So although they're poor, they're starving, they've been living in caves and tents, Gideon gets 32,000 people. Yahweh says that's far too many because I want to show you that you're going to deliver Israel by my help with 300 men. 300. So let's read three through four. We'll see that. We'll see those numbers. It says, Therefore proclaim this in the hearing of the troops. Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home. (laughs) Thus Gideon sifted them out. 22,000 returned and 10,000 remained. So he had 32,000. Yahweh said too much. And this left him with 10,000. And 22,000 men basically were too fearful. They went home. So Yahweh knows these 22,000 men aren't warriors. They're not ready to fight. Yahweh doesn't need them. Yahweh doesn't want them. He sent them home. Verse 4. After Gideon has 10,000 left. Then Yahweh said to Gideon, The troops are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them out for you. When I say, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. And when I say, This one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the troops down to the water, and Yahweh said to Gideon, All those who lap the water with their tongues... As a dog laps, you shall put to one side. All those who kneel down to drink, putting their hands to their mouths, you shall put to the other side. The number of those that lapped was 300, but all the rest of the troops knelt down to drink water. Then Yahweh said to Gideon, With the 300 that lapped, I will deliver you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go to their homes. So this was what the debate was. They said, why is Yahweh choosing the men that gets down on their hands and knees and laps water like a dog? And so some people are saying, you know, Yahweh's, well, I won't get into all that. But you can read it. You can look it up. Everybody has different viewpoints. Um, so this, this is my viewpoint of why Yahweh chose. And again, this message still applies whether my view is true or not. I think that Yahweh selected those who lapped like a dog um, actually think about it. I'm going to give you a second. Why do you think he would pick 
these men that get down with their face close to the water and lap it up like a dog? Try to answer. If anybody has something. I like that. That's my thought. So Elder Renee said their hands are free to hold a weapon. And that's, I mean, that, that's my viewpoint. That's a good point. Yeah, because he says like a dog. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, how does a dog or how does a wild animal, how does a wolf drink water? When they go down to the water, they're looking up. They're watching the horizon. They're very alert because they know yeah, they know some can come and get them because they're vulnerable in that point, which is exactly what Israel was. They were very few. They were starving. They're vulnerable. But Yahweh sends them down, and just by an act of how they drink water, because they can hold a weapon, they can hold their shield, and they're ready at any minute for that attack because it really was. It was very imminent. They were, they were camped right beside them and about to wipe them off the plate, you know, planet Earth. <clears throat> so that's kind of what I thought. And then I wanted to apply that to us. You know, how ready are we? If Yahweh did, if, if Yahshua came tomorrow, if Yahweh sent him tomorrow, or on the soonest trumpets, however you see that, are we ready? So keep that in mind as we're talking about this. These men that went down to drink water like that, that are watching the horizon, they're staying ready. They're not hoping that they have time to go get their weapon by the time the attack happens. They are ready at any minute for that battle to happen. <clears throat> so think about this in our own life. Think about that spiritually. Think about who Yahweh is choosing and what attributes they had. They didn't have the mindset of, well, I'll wait till I get attacked and then I'll go get what I need. They had what they needed and they were ready. And so that made me question, you know, they're prepared for him. Are we prepared for him to return now? You know, if, if we're on our drive home Tonight, each and every one of you, you get in a car wreck, you're taken out of the world. Are you ready? And I ask myself that. Am I ready to meet him tomorrow? Am I ready to meet him tonight? Definitely not. Um, but that's something that we should strive to, to be ready, because you never know. Um, you know, and is your faith where you want to be? Can you have an answer for your faith? If you're out in the world, you say, I believe like this, I'm a Yahweh. Do you have that answer? If they question you, why do you do tabernacles? Why do you go to services? Why do you still keep the law? Do you have that answer for somebody? Let's go to 1 Peter 3.15. <clears throat> and this is just going to back up these questions. It's not me asking you this. It says, but in your hearts, sanctify Messiah as master. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. So right there he's saying, be ready if anybody questions you, why you have that hope, why you're hoping in Messiah, why you think the kingdom is what is where we really hope to go and not heaven, things like this have an answer for it. So if you say you believe this way, you've been in it a while, you have time to study, and you don't have an answer for it, I would encourage you to study. <clears throat> so let's go to Isaiah 56, 10, and just keep this in your mind. Just keep that idea of staying ready in the forefront of your mind. Isaiah 56, 10, just 10 through 12. It 
It says Israel's sentinels are blind. So a sentinel, he's talking about a watchman. So you have you have an encampment, you got enemies at the gate, you need somebody to watch, to sound the alarm if you get attacked. This Yahweh is referring to their spiritual leaders right now. This is what we're about to read. Israel's sentinels are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are all silent dogs that can't bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They never have enough. The shepherds also have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, to their own gain, one and all. Come, they say, let us get wine. Let us fill ourselves a strong drink, and tomorrow will be like today, great beyond measure. We know that Yahweh says tomorrow isn't promised. And if you say, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, you say, Yahweh willing, because he's the one dictating it. So right now, he's, he's admonishing them, saying that they're, they're just behaving like tomorrow is a sure thing. That tomorrow is going to be better than today. That's what's happening. He's saying they're getting lazy. <clears throat> they're not ready. And this is the way the wolves get into the sheep pen. They aren't ready for his return. They aren't ready for that attack. They're not ready for a spiritual attack. So he's he's talking about physical and spiritual here. If you're a professional soldier, you're not getting drunk when the enemy's close. You're staying prepared and ready. That's what Yahweh is asking us spiritually because he talks about that our battle is spiritual, not physical. So we talk a lot about the physical. Obviously, we're relating it to the spiritual. And that's what he's telling us. Stay prepared for that spiritual battle. Don't wait. Don't say, well, he's not coming for another thousand years. Or I have till I'm 50 and then I'm going to start studying. And then I'm going to have an answer for the way I believe. If you say you believe it now, have an answer for it. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. And I'm going to wrap it up with this. We'll read 5, 1 through 11. So this is, this is kind of the end that I want you to take away from this and think about. <clears throat> it says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brother and sister, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of Yahweh will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. So he's saying that's, that's pretty instant. That's pretty quick. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day does to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. So he's talking about that spiritual awake. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So he's saying, keep, keep looking in the future, look for Messiah. Verse 9, for Yahweh has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our master, Yahshua the Messiah, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as indeed you are doing. So he's saying, stay ready for his return. Be prepared to defend your beliefs. Keep your spiritual sword on you and your heart and your mind and stay vigilant like those 300 men that Yahweh chose to fight with Gideon. <clears throat> That's mainly what I wanted to go over with that. I hope you take something from it and just keep that in your mind that to have that answer for what we believe and to stay ready for his return, because when it does happen, it will come quick. Hallelujah. Oh, give thanks unto y'all. Give thanks unto your Elohim. He performs wonderful works. He stretched the earth above the sea. 
Give thanks to Yah, for He is good. He who alone doeth great works, His kindness shall always endure. His mercy never fails. Oh, give thanks unto Yah, for it was He who made great lights for the day. He made the sun. And for the night, the moon and the stars, give thanks to Yah, for He is good. He who alone doeth great works, His kindness shall always endure. His mercy never fails. Oh, give thanks unto Yah. He struck at Egypt's stubborn pride. Their first born, he took in wrath. He led his people through the sea. Give thanks to Yah, for he is good. He who alone doeth great works, his kindness shall always endure. His mercy never fails. Oh, give thanks unto Yah. For mighty kings of mighty names He destroyed and put to shame Israel was saved from all their foes Give thanks to Yah for He is good He who alone doeth great works His kindness shall always endure His mercy never fails Give thanks unto Yah, for it was He who made the feast. Seven days we will rejoice. He leads the way to life and peace. Give thanks to Yah, for He is good. He who alone doeth great works, His kindness shall always endure. His mercy never fails. Be not dismayed, whatever be time, Yah will take care of you. Beneath His wings of love abide, Yah will take care of you. Yah will take care of you through every day. For all the way, He will take care of you. He will take care of you. Through days of toil, when heart doth fail, He will take care of you. When dangers Fish your path a sail, Yah will take care of you. Yah will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, He will take care of you. Yah will take care of you. All you may <clears throat> need, He will provide. Yah will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. Yah will take care of you. Yah will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. Yah will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, Yah will take care of you. 
Lean weary one upon his breast. Yah will take care of you. Yah will take care of you. Through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. I will take care of you. Eternal Father, in Yahshua's name, I again, I'm humbled always to be here. Uh, it's a blessing to be invited back. Uh, I pray this is worthy, and I pray that there's a gain for us in Yahshua's name. Hallelujah. I got to make a quick, uh, anybody that follows, uh, this is out for the DVD people that uh, get the DVDs um, and or go on to YouTube. I uh, made a mistake with a Hebrew word back in uh, December, I think, 23rd. A message I gave. I don't remember the whole detail, but I do recognize that I misplaced Waf or Yod or vice versa. So anybody watching, I'm aware of my mistake. So just wanted to get that out there because we rely on you as much as anybody that shows up. Thank you. All right. John chapter three. 
I'm going to start. Nothing that you haven't heard before. You know, Roger always does a beautiful job, especially this time of the year from Passover on, uh, talking about in that count from unleavened bread to Pentecost to Shavuot first fruits, working on certain spirits, fruits of the spirits. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about being born again to be first fruits today. Because that's what I believe some of us really need to do. Be born again to be a first fruit. Our second go around. So starting in John chapter 3. There was a verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. And he was a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Yahshua by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from Yahweh. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except Yah be with him. Yahshua answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of Yahweh. All right, born is the Greek 180, and again is the Greek 509. But again, what, what is it to be born? When you take them down into the Hebrew, it's Yalad. And the word again is above all, be born above all. All right, and we're going to see later on when we're doing a wave sheaf offering, what are we doing with an offering to Yah? We are bringing it up. We are lifting it above all. So we're going to put those two together. Um, Exodus 6.20, I believe, is just for tracing backwards, but I don't have slides today, so it's not really that big of a deal. But um, let me see if that's what I have here. Exodus 6, verse 20 says, And Aram took him, Joke, Kabed, his father's sister, to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses in the years of their life. Amram were 130 and seven years, I don't think. Uh, bear is 3205, a lot. So that's what it is to, to bear. Um, Judge 1134 is... A word that I want to share with you. 11 verse 34. This is just for tracing back. It says, And Jephath came to Mispat into his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. All right. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. So, only child. It's a, a Strong's number 3173. It's Yaqed. Um, to be united or soul or even be beloved. It comes from uh, Yaqed, to be of or be of me, to unite. All right, and then we know what manifest, what Yahshua being manifest is to render apparent and also could be to neuter. So if you think of that neuter when it comes to your pets, it's to cut off. Well, we need to cut off our old ways when we become born again and want to be first fruits. This is where I want to go with this. Hopefully I get there. John chapter 3, I'll go back. I'll go back. and uh, So verse 4, Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yahshua answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of Yahweh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So going back to that neuter, that cutting off of the old, the fleshly desires, the fleshly ways, focusing on the spiritual. All right. I'm going to drop it down to uh, 13. Um, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moshe lifted up the serpent, there we have lifted up. All right. In the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And again, we, you know, the most common we've ever seen, for Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that so whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All right? And that was that begotten. That was where uh, we go back to Judges and say only, Yakin, you know, but soul, beloved, to be of, and again, we know Yahshua manifested, was made, you know, set apart, manifest as apparent or declared, you know, rendered, declared. All right. 
For Yahweh sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of Yahweh. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in Yahweh. You know, it's funny because in the beginning of time at Cain and Abel, right? We all know the story of Cain killing his brother, right? And in chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 7, this is something simple that Yahweh says to them. If thou doest well, shalt not that be accepted? You do good, you'd be accepted, right? You give me a first fruit good, believe in my son. But if you don't, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And then of thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. If we don't cut that off when we're born again, all right, true repentance and true trying to live properly for Yah, that sin is going to lie there and control us always. It's always going to be like a fly that gets in the window. I know it's a crazy analogy. I use it a lot. But you have a crack in a window, a fly gets in, you can open every window you got. That fly will not leave. Sin will not leave our life. It doesn't want to. It loves resting with us. The enemy loves when that happens. And it gets to a point sometimes where not only we have to worry about the parable where Yahshua talked about when we receive that seed, what we do with it, the word, losing it before we leave the door here, are we going to lose it even before we get here and come and keep his days? So we got to really, truly, truly neuter that, neuter that sinful, lusting, worldly. Sister just gave a testimony, Sister Jay, about what the football players guy I didn't know about that but I don't you know they got mad at a guy because he made some nice comment about his wife and she compared that well you brothers do that and that's a good thing that you ain't accepted by the world then you know so again the world is the world and we got to try to stay apart from it so we all know this all right so uh, for everyone that doeth evil hate of the light yeah but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in Yahweh. So, and again, we know Yahshua was manifested for us, rendered apparent or declared apparent. He's declaring us to be manifest. All right? Set apart. Chosen. There's, you know, we've heard all of these. I'm not going to give you anything you've never heard before. So, again, when we see that word again, it's above all. I think I trace it out of Genesis chapter 6. So let me run back there real quick. Refresh my memory, please. 616. A, a window shall thou make to the ark, and in a cubit thou shalt finish it above, and the door of the ark thou shalt set inside thereof with lower, second, and third stories thou shalt make it. Yeah, so above is 4605. But a structure. Yah has given blueprints to know how to build something that you're going to live in and survive when nobody else is. Right? If you weren't on that ark, if you weren't one of those chosen animals, if you weren't Noah's family, you're not there. You're done. That was it. End of game, end of story. So there were certain aspects that Noah was given, but the key word there was above all. I took that. It's 4605 in the Hebrew. All right. So, and then we know that Yahshua is born from above, and we need to be born from above. All right. Let me look here in Exodus 25. He made us out of the dust, all right? But if we're going to have his spirit in us, where is that spirit coming from? Above. We are born from above, and that's how we're supposed to be. We weren't. Some of us were never that way. Some of us were part-time that way. Some of us thought we were that way. Now we know we weren't, so we have to work on it. If, you, if it works for you, and I know I do. So let me see here. What do I got? 21 hours of cooking license. Yeah. So he's talking about, again, the mercy seat. So this is in Exodus 25, chapter 25, verse 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, 
I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So where is he going to meet? Above. From above and a place that's above. That we need to be, and that first fruit is something that's going to be raised first and above. Yahshua is the first fruit, right? He's the first fruit raised. If he's in us, then that's where we're going to be. If we deserve it. If we earn it. If we neuter the old ways, being born again. Again, what are we going to be born again? Not to be the same thing we were. If you were riding right and born in this faith and doing it right, you're not going to be born again to be worse. You know, go back to, you know, let me start something else crazy. You know, I mean, Ben brought it up in Judges. I mean, that was beautiful. But again, look what the children of Israel were doing. And that wasn't even probably the dirtiest of the dark, dirty things they'd been doing in Babylonian and other worship when they were in captivity. All right. And we all came from somewhere. Most of us came out of something. So born again to be what? Something positive, a first fruit. And again, I'm filling in for the brother, and his, he was great at that message. It was one of my favorite times when he talked about working on those fruits of the Spirit during that 50-day count, that time to Pentecost. What are you going to work on? And I, always, I think I talked about it once before. Not only work on doing the good, but making sure the bad spirits are crushed down, cut, neutered. And there you go. Cut away. All right. So again, uh, 4605 is that word. It's my all. And it, again, it's the upper part, you know. Um, so again, we started the count back in unleavened bread. Tomorrow is the final day. It's that Pentecost day, that first fruit, Shavuot. And where are we working on it? And again, we have that wave that you see in Leviticus 23. Dennis read it today. So you have a wave and it's something that you're going to, boom, raise up. So are we going to get raised up when it's our turn? We know Yahshua was raised up. That, yeah, that's right. That is correct. We got to work. 23 in Leviticus, uh, let's see, 14, I believe, talks about it. So, Leviticus 23, 14, if you'll join me, I'm going to start there. And ye shall eat neither bread, Dennis read this earlier, but nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye brought an offering unto your yacht. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seventh Sabbath shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, ye shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. Ye shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves and two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour, they shall be baked with leaven, they are the first fruits on the Yahweh. That's uh, 1061 is the Hebrew Strong's. It's Bakor. Uh, Bakor. All right. And it's basically a mindset to give the first to Yah, the mindset. So when we always hear, and, and Ben brought it up in his sermonette, and we, you know, we hear it in many messages, there's spiritual and there's physical. So, yeah, you're physically going to stand here and bake a loaf of bread and wave it, but you're spiritually also in your mindset. It's got to be the first thing that you think about. It can't be, I'm going to eat this loaf before I go down there and wave his loaf. I believe we have to have the mindset of wanting to wave our offering to him first. Then, you know, it's just like with coming into the Passover time with a beef, with the grain, fresh ears. You have to have that Omer offering. He wants the first offering. He don't want what's stored in the warehouse or what's left over after you got done feasting. He wants first. So if we're going to be born again to be a first fruit, we need to spiritually have a mindset that Yah is first always through Yahshua, in my view. All right. Why? Because he gave us what? Not only his first child, but his what? Only. 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 For us. And we didn't have it come. We didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve it. All right. Matthew chapter 1. 
if you'll join me. This is leading up to the birth. Not a story that nobody's heard of before. And we know the story that an, an angel visited Miriam and was telling her this story about how she's going to have this son. Joseph and her hadn't known each other yet, right? They hadn't been together as a husband and wife. And he might have been having thoughts. And actually, uh, I'll go to 19. And Joseph, her husband being just a man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. I mean, I imagine in those times, you'd have been embarrassed. Like, how does your wife get pregnant when you hadn't done anything? You know he was taking ribbing on the job, right? You know, well, you know, she's stepping out on you, man. Look at her. No, that's from an angel of Yahweh. Okay. Are you drinking some whiskey at lunchtime there, brother? Or what are you doing on a job site? I mean, I can't imagine what the man might have been going through, right? But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, and thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the set-apart spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of Yahweh by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as El is with us, and then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of Yahweh had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Yahushua. Fill in it for Roger. I'll use Roger's terms. But anyway, so again, not touched by any man was this woman. And that's the only way that begotten could be above and go on to be a perfect sacrifice for us and be raised as a first fruit all right 2017 in john so when he had risen you know after the passover and yahshua said this unto uh, mary and touch me not for i am not yet ascended to my father but go to my brother and saying that am i ascend unto my father and your father and to my elohim and your elohim all right, and then she came and told the disciples that she had seen the master and they had spoken these things. They knew that was going to happen. So again, but he had to rise first. So even at that time, he didn't want to be touched by human hands in this transitional period, I'm assuming, because he was on the way up. So he could have been defiled, it seems like, if they had touched him before he totally raised after his death and resurrection. So again, in his birth and even in his death, he couldn't be defiled by us, by a human. And uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. Let's see what I got here, 20 and 22. Okay, so here it is. And again, elevated like a wave sheaf. We talked about a wave sheaf offering is something that gets elevated, all right? Verse 20 in chapter 15 in Corinthians, uh, the first book. But now is Messiah risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Messiah the first fruits afterward, they that are Messiah at his coming. So he's the first. Are we going to be part of that second, third, fourth, whatever? I bet we all not going to complain if we're part of it. Sister brought up football. Now you got me thinking about it. So they got, what do they call it, a draft every year. And then people can pick the college players they think are best, right? And it's a big deal to be like the number one round. But I bet if you're a young man playing football in college and you want to be an NFL player, you don't really care when you get drafted or by whom. As long as you get drafted, and that's your job. So, I don't know about you, but I want to be a first fruit somehow, some way. Even if it, I might have to hold on to like your back or something, crawl up there. But hey, I'm taking it. I got some things here. So, again, risen, elevated. We have tomorrow the wave sheet. You know, we had the wave sheet. Now we have the first fruits tomorrow. 
We're doing it in order. James chapter 1, let's see what I got. All right, so this is just like a warning, I guess. Chapter uh, 1 in James, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of Elohim. For Elohim cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So again, going back to prior to being born again, what were we enticed by? Worldly lust, worldly things. That is no, those are not things of Yahweh. He's not going to tempt you with those things. Yahshua is going to tempt you with good things. All right, so we need to neuter ourselves after being immersed, born again, to be a first fruit. All right. Verse 14, but every man is tempted when he was drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it was finished bringeth forth death. Goes back to Genesis 4-7. Once you are in that sinful mind, it's going to follow you around. It's going to lack on to you. It's going to latch on to you, and it's just going to control you. And it doesn't matter, I don't believe, what you try to do. It's just going to follow you around, haunting you all the time. Those are your choices. But Yah's not going to tempt you with that. That's the enemy. Again, he knows his time is short. We hear that all the time in our messages, and it's not a lie. He doesn't want to be alone. So he's out there deceiving, and he does a good job. But Yah's not going to tempt us with that. He wants us to be in that first fruit. But he also expects us to work hard at it and to be refined, right? And to be ripe and worthy. 16, do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? Above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth, that we should be what? A kind of first fruits of his creatures. He's putting us right there in realm with his only begotten son. A kind of. Are you kind of a football player? Yeah, I'm kind of. That's good. You're getting paid. I'm not Yahshua, but I'm kind of a first fruit. I'm taking it. I'm proud of it if I was called that by Yah right now. Because again, once we're born again through the baptism, cut, neuter away the old. Let that go down the river. As you brothers have been preaching it way longer than me. The watery grave. But you have to kill that old man, that old lusty desires of the world. And can't worry about what they're going to think of you, how they're going to treat you, whether they be family, loved ones. Doesn't mean you can't love family or care about people that ain't in the faith, but we cannot be yoked to them and to the things of importance. All right. Let's see. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians, please. Let's see what I got. Chapter 5. 5 through 9, I'm going to read. <clears throat> and this basically, they got a head, uh, like a notice in the uh, YRM, a resurrection and reconciliation to Yah. So that would be great. Verse 5, chapter 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is Elohim, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from Yahweh. True story. Here on the you know, the fleshly desires and all, right? For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with Yahweh that's that mindset I mentioned earlier that first fruit mindset of giving him first there's a lot of things to enjoy on this planet right we just heard a testimony about a new old car right there's nothing wrong with enjoying a car believe me it's a nice thing to have but the first mindset is I would rather we don't have cars and we just be up there or he's down here with us in the kingdom he's bringing I misspake when I say we go up there but you know it came from above those are the things that are worthy, all right? Verse 9, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. That's the key, being accepted. How many times 
would we read scripture if a sacrifice or an offering was not accepted? I think I told I was told the story that the high priest didn't make it back out of the tabernacle to holy of holies if it wasn't set. So there's you know some serious repercussions. So we got to pray that we are accepted as a first fruit. Hallelujah. Again, accepted the wave sheaf. You know, not leftover old grain. Oh, that's what's left over there in that corn bin this week. Okay, he could have it. No, the first. Fresh grain, Abib. That's why he tells us to guard that month, Shamar. We talked about it in Bible study. Observe the month of Abib. That's Shamar. Guard it. That's fresh grain coming in. Born again grain, right? Even like a new moon, it's born again, right? It goes from a dark and then there's that sliver. It's a crowning new month or a new time period all right yah firsts in everything romans chapter 8 let's start in verse 5 for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against Yahweh, for it is not subject to the law of Yahweh, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please Elohim. All right, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of Yahweh dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Messiah, he is none of his. So starting backwards here. All right, again, if you're more worried about the fleshly things that the world is worried about, you're going to break Yah's laws to go and earn the money to have them. Case in point, you're not working right now because you're here on a Sabbath. And I'm pretty much, I'd put money down if I was a betting man that you'll be here tomorrow not working because guess what? It's I day. But if you needed something that you really wanted more than you cared about your father and creator and your savior, You'd go and do it. And that's what people do. They worry about it. I talk to people like that all the time. You know? Ben was talking in his message about them men hiding in caves because they knew they were wrong. And we know it's going to happen again at the end times because the world that we know is going to come apart and people are not going to understand what's happening. And they're not going to be worried about drawing nigh unto Yah like they're supposed to. They're going to be worried about, ooh, is my money in the bank okay? I didn't say it's bad to have money. Don't mistake me for that. But anyway, carnally minded, worried about that fleshly desire is death, and spiritual minded is life. Again, spiritually putting Yahweh first. Verse 10, I'm going to read. Uh, and if Messiah be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Yahshua from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Messiah from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brother, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many are led by the spirit of Elohim, they are the sons of Elohim. If you're a son of his, what did he do with his son? What's he going to do with us? All right. And it's acceptable to him. And if we are accepted by him, we will be in his house, in his kingdom in that time. Acts chapter 8, um, verse 27. I'm going to start at. And we've, we've read this before. Uh, I'm sure in a lot of times, especially in baptism, uh, when, when we're talking to people. And, but then he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for the worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading his light, the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him, and read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandeth thou what thou readest? 
And the man said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet, this of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Yahshua. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is the water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Yahshua Messiah is the son of Elohim. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and baptized him. And when they were come out of the water, the spirit of Yahweh caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, because he knows he was taking his first step to neutering his old life and making his way toward a new life, being a first fruit or a kind of first fruit. So born again, we need to be born again. And the only way to do that is through water and that spirit that comes upon us from above. It only makes sense that we're going to give offerings and try to behave to those that are above, to Yah above, where it belongs, where it all comes from. It gets tough, all right? You come out of the water, that's just the beginning of the road. It's like coming out of Ohio, Indiana. <laughs> it's rough across Indiana I-70. It's only the beginning of your trip. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, once you get the Little East, but I only make a joke. But anyway, let's go over to Matthew because in chapter 3, let's see. Thirteen to seventeen. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And John forbade him and saying, I have no need to be baptized. I have need to be baptized of thee, and you coming to me. And Yahshua answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered him. All right. And Yahshua, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. Unto him, and he saw the spirit of Yahweh descending like a dove, and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, "This is my beloved son, in whom am I well pleased." All right. Right off the bat, after that. Verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 1, Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So right off the bat, there's going to be trials. Right off the bat. And it's, it ain't just a few pages like we see here. Because we got to rely on his strength to get by it every day. This is a nonstop temptation in our lives. All right? So... If he got tempted right after his baptism, we certainly shouldn't expect anything else. And then once we're walking, things might be going well. We're in this faith, right? A lot of you longer than me, but no matter how many years, and then you have your ups and your downs, and then you're like, what the heck is going on today? And there it is. So we need to be on, a, you know, be on the lookout, like Brother mentioned, watchmen. You know, you got to be on the lookout for what's happening because the enemy is, all around, them guys that were drinking out of the water, he said, great, the horizon. And I believe that was your also response, brother. Pay attention, because when you're, you know, you're if you're thirsty, you're just thinking about something. Yeah, I want my drink. But decoys, like in hunting, right? You think you're getting something you want, and there's somebody out there to do you harm. So let's go over to Matthew, or no, yeah, Matthew chapter 5. What do I got here? Uh, let me go on. 20 and 21. So for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall, shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. 
And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of Gehenna fire. Therefore ye bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rememberest that your brother hath ought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first. Be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. That leads into anything you want to ever study about love. A new commandment I give to you, love one another like you love Yah. Without it, we're nothing. All right? And again, without it, it doesn't matter if you can recite the pure Hebrew alphabet from beginning to end, from the first day it was given, to the modern Hebraic, to any language, and recite every verse in here without looking it up. That'd be impressive. I'm not good at that. But if you can't do it with love, it doesn't really suit you. You're not going to be a first fruit, and neither will I if I don't start having some love. It all revolves to love. All right? It all. All right? So, no, you know, again, having a problem, and I don't mean just brother, brother or sister. Having a problem, we got to solve that before we go any further. I believe what Yahweh's saying there is if you have a wave offering for me, a gift that you're going to raise up, you better make sure you're right with the people next to you because then it's unacceptable it becomes what Cain's gift was unacceptable and they had an interesting note in that because Cain's gift was of the ground which was already cursed because of Abraham's or because of Adam's sin excuse me almost misspoke again all right so that's an interesting thing you know cursed gift from cursed ground and then he was cursed even more because he committed murder Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's start in verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the master, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. A vocation, we know it's a job, right? We know when they were talking about it, there's work to be done. Brother has t-shirts, he has a ministry, witnessing. Sometimes people come to you, sometimes we might have to go to them or they meet us somewhere, be ready with an answer. But anyway, uh, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Again, unity. And what did we say earlier about the begotten, the one? Right? What did I say that was? Yep. United. A soul. All right? To be of one. To unite. So we see unite, you know, unity. Be in peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One master, one faith, one baptism. One L and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And if he's in us, we cannot fail. Because he would not accept it. I'll go back to 1 Corinthians, and I think that's all I have. 1 Corinthians 15. All right. Verse uh, 50 in chapter 15 in the first Corinthians. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all, we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, death, where is thy sting, O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. 
but thanks be to Elohim, which giveth us the victory through our master, Yahshua HaMashiach. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable always, abounding in the work of Yahweh, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in Yahweh. May we be born again to be first fruits. Yah bless you at this feast day coming tomorrow. I pray I did not uh, waste your time up here. Yah bless. Thanks for having me. And now from Numbers, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 22. Number 622 says, And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Ye barechacha Yahweh vayishmerecha, Yair Yahweh panav elacha vifanecha, Yeshe Yahweh panav elacha vayashim lecha, Shalom. Yahweh bless thee and keep thee. Yahweh make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Hallelujah. For questions or comments or to inquire about our DVDs or literature, contact Yahweh's Assembly in Messiah by writing to YAIM. 401 North Roby Farm Road, Rocheport, Missouri, 65279. Or visit us online at www.yaim.org. Or call us at telephone number 573-698-4335.